children come back to Narnia. They're in the ruins of Cair Paravel, but they don't know it yet. And they're sitting around and they're saying, you know, slowly it begins to dawn on them, wait a minute. It doesn't look like what I think it should look like, but there's increasing lines of evidence that we're in the ruins of Caraparabell. If that's so, well, then this should be here. Well, if that's so, then this should be here. Well, then, and, and but we're, you know, but Caraparabell was not an island. Well, it was on a peninsula, and maybe the land is eroded. And then the final test of the big test of the hypothesis is like, well, if that's the case, then the treasure chamber should be right behind us. Okay, well, they tear it down, and they go in there, and yes, the treasure chamber is there, and then they're all convinced. We're in some sort of, yes, this is that place, something's different, but we are there. And that's essentially what we see when we look at the genomes. We know, based on the spatial orientation, all the stuff's in the right place. Yeah, some of it's defective, but it's completely consistent with what you would expect based on it once having been the same, but now have become different through speciation. I don't know if I can explain it any better than that. All right, are we good to wrap up, get closer to wrap up? Okay, so the line, these lines of evidence that I've shown you tonight, they're independent from one another. These are different lines of evidence that you can find from the genome. They don't depend on one another, yet they cohere into a pattern that very strongly suggests that humans share ancestry with other forms of life. And strongly suggest is scientific speak. Um, if you'll pardon the one slight obscenity for the night, my supervisor as a PhD student used to say, what really matters in terms of statistical test is the bloody obvious test. This passes readily that bloody obvious test, right? It's obvious, the pattern is obvious. Scientists are not often given to sort of really strong saying this, like in other words, I wouldn't say this proves common ancestry, this proves common descent. Science does not offer you proof. It offers you converging lines of evidence through a theoretical explanatory framework that has not yet been falsified by experimentation. When we go digging in the genome, we have not yet falsified this hypothesis that humans and other forms of life share a common ancestor. Okay. Each one of these lines of evidence is problematic from an anti-evolutionary perspective. Like Terry has very much noted, the pseudogene one is very troubling because it's very easy to kind of get an objective, qualitative handle on what's going on. Those other lines of evidence to a biologist who knows the data are equally compelling or even more so. Believers need to be prepared for this, an encounter with this type of evidence. And the main reason is the person who is most likely to present this evidence to them is not somebody from within Christianity. The most likely person to present this evidence to your children, my children, is someone who is coming from outside our faith who is saying, look, this proves your faith wrong. And most likely, there will be philosophical and metaphysical baggage attached to this information that basically says, we can now discard your faith, right? This proves Genesis wrong, as it were, is what this person, this person will, will say, right? Or if they go off to a university at, you know, a secular university, the prof may even unknowingly import some metaphysical, metaphysical baggage into their presentation of the standard science. Okay. This, I would argue, is a category error because it goes beyond science. Science gives you testable, predictable explanations, explanatory framework that explains the natural world through natural causes. It doesn't say anything about whether or not God exists or doesn't exist because that goes beyond what science can address. It's beyond the scope of science. But a lot of the times in the secular world, those things get conflated together. Now, on the other hand, as Christians, we are also piling on. These poor students that are going to be encountered with this evidence have been taught within our own faith tradition that they need to make a choice, that creation and evolution are dichotomous, it's one or the other. Now, if you're set up to believe that in your own faith tradition, then you go off to university and you encounter this evidence, it's a perfect storm waiting to shipwreck somebody's faith. Now, I would argue also, seeing as this evening is supposed to be in some way a response to the Truth Project, I think the Truth Project does this in spades. And I was actually 
surprised at how aggressive they were on this point. I sort of thought the Truth Project would maybe touch on it in one or two videos, but it's in a lot of the videos it's used as an example of sort of the classic atheistic view of the world, atheism and evolution kind of being put together. Okay, so what then? How should we read Genesis? So here are just my thoughts. Now we're stepping outside of my area of expertise. And there's one or two profs at Trinity that I kind of tapped on the shoulder and said, you know, would you be willing to come and chat with some people? Because I'm going to give them the biology. Would you be willing to come and chat about Genesis and the ancient Near East and context and whatnot? The question is, okay, what is going on in Genesis? Because we're very used to reading Genesis in a certain way within the Christian faith that would seem to be in agreement with what the Truth Project and other ministries are, are saying, one or the other. So some questions that I would just like to pose, and we can talk about this more in the discussion time. Is Genesis able to address modern scientific concerns? Does a conservative exegesis, that just means interpretation of Genesis, require that one hold an anti-evolutionary stance? And the third question is, did God accommodate his message to the original recipients? Accommodation is a technical term. Um, it goes back to Calvin and other theologians. Obviously, at some level, God accommodates. He is almighty, transcendent, omniscient, and we are finite creatures. Obviously, he's going to have to dumb it down for our benefit, right? <laughs> whatever Genesis could have been or might have been or whatever, we are not fully able to understand what is in the mind of God. If he's going to tell us what's going on, any communication from God to humanity is going to have some accommodational aspects as well as perhaps incarnational aspects, right? Incarnational in the sense of God communicating his transcendent, almighty, all-powerful truth in a form that we can understand. Now, we do this all the time with our kids, okay? If I'm going to explain to my kids how biology works, I'm going to have to pitch it to their level in a way that they can understand. So that's basically the idea of accommodation. Okay. All right. So, you might be surprised to know that many evangelical scholars who I think most of us would agree are legitimate evangelical scholars who know nothing of biology, who work on understanding Genesis and other texts, have of their own accord come to the conclusion that Genesis is not addressing modern scientific concerns and that, surprisingly, a conservative understanding